Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. And you can see my slides? Yep. Yes. Okay, so it's Wednesday, April 21st, and we're still talking about the structure of globular proteins. And we're analyzing that structure using, well, I'm showing you experimental data, and then I'm also showing you a variety of computational techniques. I mentioned cores of proteins uh, during the last lecture, and I'm gonna go into more detail into the cores of proteins in this uh, lecture. So let me click ahead to where we were. Another comment is there was, uh, there were several good questions just um, on Monday. I appreciate that, that's great. And there was a question about the shape of the distributions of the bond lengths and um, bond angles. So I wanted to show you that today the data that I showed here um, did, didn't have many bond lengths and bond angles. And so here's an example of a bond angle between two covalently, between three covalently bonded uh, atoms along the backbone. So a nitrogen, a C alpha, and then a carboxyl carbon. And here are examples of that for thousands, you know, taken from thousands of experimentally determined structures, X-ray crystal structures. And so you see, it's not exactly Gaussian, but it's the deviations aren't that strong. And um, here's an example of a bond length uh, between a nitrogen and a C alpha. And again, so you see that the, the standard deviation for the lengths is around uh, a tenth of an angstrom. This is an angstrom scale. And then here it's uh, plus or minus five degrees. And so this is again, just emphasizing that there are uh, degrees of freedom in proteins that are fairly well fixed, determined by the nature of bonded atoms. And then there are other degrees of freedom that aren't as fixed, uh, they fluctuate from one amino acid to another or, and from one uh, protein structure to another. And those are the degrees of freedom that are interesting to predict and uh, that we're gonna talk about in this lecture and uh, the next one. So let me quick click through to where we were. Uh, so we had talked about other degrees of freedom th that fluctuate more from one amino acid to another and, and from one protein structure to another is a, a dihedral angle. And so every four bonded atoms along a chain, you'll have a dihedral angle. If the, the dihedral angle involves any backbone atoms, so C, C alpha, uh, so the nitrogen, um, the oxygen, the uh, C alpha and the carboxyl uh, carbon, then it is a backbone dihedral angle. And then in, if it involves exclusively side chain uh, atoms, say C beta and uh, further from the C alpha, then it, that's called a side chain dihedral angle. And so this is where we were uh, last time I started talking about um, backbone dihedral angles. And so the way to, um, there's a, a preferred definition of backbone dihedral angles. And so there's a phi and psi. So in general, as you move along a, the, the backbone chain, there are four dihedral angles that you can define. And the, the way that the chain is broken up is, typically through what's called a dipeptide. And so that's basically a central amino acid and then flanked by half a half of a amino acid on the left and half of amino acid on the right. And so here I show you an alanine dipeptide um, so that it has, you know, that, that C beta there 
as a side chain flanked by uh, three hydrogens. Um, the side chain doesn't, doesn't matter since we're focusing on the, on the backbone, but here's the standard definition for how you define the backbone dihedral angles. So when you're looking at this dipeptide, there are four backbone dihedral angles that you can make. There's the, and um, I'm gonna go back and forth uh, because it happens in the literature that um, C prime means the carboxyl carbon, but sometimes I drop the prime and it'll just say C, so sorry. So if you see C without an alpha or C with a prime, that means the carboxyl carbon. And then if you see a C alpha, then obviously that's the C alpha. And so when you're looking at um, this dipeptide, if you include the, the C prime to the left, so that's uh, this one here, um, and then the N, so you're moving to the right, then the C alpha, and then the next carboxyl carbon, then that's the defined as the phi dihedral angle. And so uh, this one includes uh, two carboxyl atoms, um, uh, carboxyl carbon atoms, um, one from the I minus one amino acid and one from the ith amino acid. So typically the nomenclatures, if you're talking about the central ith amino acid, you drop the I uh, notation. And, and so then if you just uh, shift one, uh, sh shift from the carboxyl carbon to the nitrogen, then you have N, C alpha, the carboxyl um, carbon, and then the next nitrogen from the I plus one um, amino acid. And so that dihedral angle involves two nitrogens, not two uh, carboxyl carbons. And those are uh, the, the ubiquitous or the frequently um, discussed phi and psi backbone dihedral angles. And then there are two other angles that you can define uh, for four atoms along this dipeptide. Um, and they involve two um, alpha carbons. So you can have the I minus one alpha carbon and the I th alpha carbon, or you can have the alpha carbon and the I plus one alpha carbon. And so those two um, backbone dihedral angles are typically very flat. They're either in the zero or 180 uh, conformation, very flat. And so that's why we're not gonna talk about those uh, much because they don't, they don't vary significantly. Whereas phi and psi can have significant variations in trying to predict what their values are is a general topic of, of protein structure prediction. And it influences the type of secondary structure that a region of a, of, of a protein will take on. Going through these um, slides, I'll, I'll, I'll try to always have you know, colors that correspond to the particular atom types. So the pink is, is carbon, the, the blue is nitrogen, the um, darker pink, so I'm colorblind, so I'm sort of making these up. <laughs> darker pink is oxygen, the whitish is hydrogen, and the yellowish is uh, sulfur. And so sulfurs are, are rare. Uh, they occur in side chains of, for example, methionine um, amino acids. And so with that definition, you can um, talk about what are called Ramachandran plots. So Ramachandran was a physical chemist or a chemical physicist in the 60s and 70s was when he was um, getting a lot of his work done. And he had the suggestion if we, and, and so that's about the time when the first uh, crystal structures, uh, protein crystal structures were being generated. And so there's this idea, you know, we're getting nice experimental information about proteins. Are there any theoretical ways that I can, you know, try to predict that structure or understand that structure? And so he had the idea that I want to try to understand the particular values that phi and psi take on by just considering a single dipeptide. So not trying to predict the phi's and size of the entire structure or in the context of the full protein, but just trying to predict phi and psi based on local um, 
geometry, just of a of the of a dipeptide isolated uh, from its environment. And so the other thing to think about is, so in general, what a Ramachandran plot is um, the backbone dihedral angle phi is on the horizontal axis and the uh, psi backbone dihedral angle is on the vertical axis. And typically the, the, the range that's plotted is typically from negative 180 degrees to 180 degrees. And that's fairly common um, convention for um, backbone dihedral angles. But then when you talk about side chain dihedral angles, they typically go from zero to 360. So you always have to have an interval um, from zero to two pi, some, some interval of two pi, but there are different conventions about the beginning and end of that interval. So in general, a Ramachandran plot is uh, a, a two-dimensional way of plotting the, the values that, that are found in proteins. But what's a little confusing is one is a, is, is, a, is a prediction. So Ramachandran generated a prediction and it doesn't have any experimental data. And another is, um, you know, experimental data just saying, well, I'm going to look at protein crystal structures and I'm going to ask, um, you know, what I find uh, for the various amino acids. Another thing is that you could imagine Ramachandran plots for uh, different types of amino acids. Um, even though the values you're plotting are phi's and size, which just depend on the backbone, and every amino acid has, you know, backbone uh, phi's and size. And so you can talk about a Ramachandran plot for alanine, and you can talk about a Ramachandran plot for leucine. But one of the interesting questions would be, are they similar? That they're not that dependent, they're not too dependent on the side chain. So again, um, what Ramachandran do, did with the theoretical model is just considered a dipeptide in the absence of the environment of the, you know, the rest of the protein. Whereas if you're uh, plotting actual data from experimental crystal structures, obviously that, that particular protein has an, you know, an environment. And so you're not plotting just the dipeptides in isolation. So um, since glycine is, um, you know, so, so, you know, has such a special side chain, um, it's different, it has a different prediction than all the other amino acids, which have uh, beta uh, carbons, uh, you know, involved in the side chains. And so that's why we're making a dis distinction here between non-glycine amino acids and glycine. But the basic idea is he um, built a sort of physical model for a dip dipeptide. He basically said, well, I'm gonna have the correct uh, backbone atoms of a dipeptide bonded together. I'm gonna specify their separations by you know, the typical values of the bond lengths. And then I'm going to um, ascribe to those atoms certain sizes. Uh, for example, those determined by Van der Waals equation of state. So I'm just going to say, I'm going to give each atom a, a diameter. I'm going to say they're, they're bonded to each other. And then I'm, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to you know, imagine uh, physically rotating that dipeptide so it has particular values of phi and psi. So for example, in the plot, you can see that um, there's a phi, you can ask, well, I have a phi of negative 90. I have a psi of negative 90. I'm gonna put that dipeptide into that particular uh, backbone conformation. And I'm gonna ask, do any of the non-bonded atoms in that dipeptide overlap? So for example, the oxygen, um, of the, the, the oxygen of the uh, central uh, carboxyl group, does it have any clashes um, with the nitrogen? Uh, 
or does the uh, beta uh, carbon of the uh, you know the side chain overlap with any other atoms in the dipeptide? And so, um, going through that that model, what he found was that there were allowed configurations and disallowed configurations uh, based on atomic overlap. So if there were any atomic overlaps, not non-bonded atomic overlaps, he said that that was disallowed. And if there were no non-bonded overlaps between atoms, that was allowed. And so the, the exterior region that's white, so for example, I'll pick one, 90 degree phi, and negative 90 degrees psi, um, that's in a white region. So that's an allowed, sorry, that's on a disallowed configuration. So all the white region is disallowed. Another uh, one is negative 90 degree uh, phi and negative 90 degree psi. That's in the exterior white region. And so that's uh, disallowed. But then there were um, regions that were bounded by um, sort of the interior regions that are bounded by these black segments. And those were uh, allowed. There were no atomic overlaps at, at those particular phi's and sides. So for example, I'll pick one a negative 90 degree phi and a zero degree or a, let's say a 45 degree psi. That's in this, um, within this interior bounded region. And so that was an allowed configuration. And then he, he did, uh, he said, well, maybe it's very difficult to know exactly what the uh, atomic diameters are. So I'm going to allow some fluctuations in the sizes of the atoms. And so he said um, the, the gray uh, black regions were uh, larger atom sizes and the uh, larger bounded regions were smaller atomic sizes. And so that was the Ramachandran uh, prediction. And so I just um, redraw it here. Again, the, the dashed lines are the, the uh, small atomic sizes and the red regions are the large atomic sizes. And then the speckles are um, alanine dipeptides that are extracted from uh, protein, uh, high resolution protein crystal structures. And so, so you say to you, you sh this shows to a large degree the, um, the uh, alanines in uh, protein crystal structures that are experimentally determined obey the Ramachandran bounds. And so even to this day, um, the quality of a, a protein crystal structure can be evaluated by how many uh, what are called Ramachandran outliers there are. And those are specs or um, these little dots or instances of amino acid um, backbone dihedral angles that don't fall in the Ramachandran bounds. So one thing that's um, hard is, um, is you know, the, more so more more refined details of this map. So, for example, in later studies uh, in the community, as well as uh, my studies, have found that the particular conformations that phi and psi take on can be influenced by um, other things, like the the tau angle, which is a particular bond angle of the central uh, C alpha atom. So, for example, uh, tau is the bond angle between the nitrogen, the C alpha and the carboxyl carbon. And so if that angle is larger, then you can get a wider range of allowed conformations versus when it's uh, smaller. And so that has shown to be influence um, which phi's and size can occur. Another uh, subtlety or importance is the, the density of points. So for example, the points in this plot are not uni uniformly distributed. So in this particular plot, there's a lot of points in the lower region, which tends to be more alpha helical structures. And so then the question is, uh, what causes that? Should 
uh, protein force fields um, include that, that there's sort of a bias towards alpha helical structure, or do I just uniformly sample the allowed confirmations from the Ramachandran plot? So do I, should I sample alpha helical confirmations uh, more, which are those with uh, lower values of psi, or should I uniformly sample the entire allowed Ramachandran um, space? So that question has been discussed a lot, uh, both in the community and by, by my group. And so I reproduce, well, yeah, I reproduce um, in the upper right corner. So panel E is uh, data of alanine dipeptides from high resolution protein crystal structures. And so you see here, I actually plot a probability density where the the color is uh, determines the probability of having a particular phi and psi. So for example, yellow is relatively low probability, whereas red and black is much higher probability. And so then this, this strong peak at alpha helical values shows up. And so again, I, I say again that the, the question is, when I uh, carry out a simulation, uh, do I, include this, uh, this bias in my force field, or was that bias created by the data set that uh, for some reason experimentalists chose alpha helical proteins to crystallize or alpha helical proteins are easier to crystallize. And so um, there's another database and what they try to do is basically um, try to create a more um, disordered database of protein crystal structures. Uh, unfortunately, to some degree, it, it, it turns out that you basically just remove alpha helices. So if you remove the, this more disordered uh, database of, of uh, alanine dipeptides, looks like you basically remove the alpha helical content and then uh, peak in the, the, beta, the more beta sheet-like uh, content shows up. And so then the question is, well, is this a, a more sort of intrinsic um, uh, phi psi distribution that's not um, affected by uh, which proteins uh, crystallize or that experimentalists choose um, you know, alpha helical proteins over um, non-alpha helical proteins? So then in the other panels, so that's sort of still a lingering a debate about what is the intrinsic um, phi psi distribution for a, a single dipeptide. Um, uh, so one another approach you can take is uh, look at, uh, and we'll talk a lot more about molecular dynamics, but uh, just uh, for now, assume that there are simulations exist um, where they can carry out molecular dynamics uh, of proteins, but also just single amino acid dipeptides in water. And then you can just uh, try to measure the, uh, through, through molecular dynamic simulations, try to measure the intrinsic uh, phi psi uh, probability distribution of an alanine dipeptide. And um, so I show basically, um, very common force fields. Um, there's a couple amber force fields in A and B. So A and B, so the left column is an amber force field, which, and then the other is a charm force field. So those are sort of the two um, monolithic, or the two uh, big players in the force field, molecular dynamics force field community for, for proteins. And so uh, what I want to show here is, is one thing is that some, sometimes the force field uh, doesn't work that well. So for example, in C, um, you see that you get psi values around a lot, relatively abundant uh, psi values around negative 120, which is not really borne out in the uh, crystal structures. Although um, some of the COIL databases do have some negative 120 values. Um, but again, there's also not and, and also you can get different values of sort of the middle section. 
So for example, in panel C, for this particular charm force field, there's not a lot of uh, values at psi equals uh, zero degrees, whereas in uh, some of the other force fields there are. And then again, they, they also don't agree on the relative uh, beta and alpha helical content. So in general, I would say that um, currently there's still some debate about the intrinsic um, uh, propensities for forming alpha helical and beta sheet content. And I will address that um, uh, in, in, in these discussions by sort of advocating for a simpler approach, um, not using the current um, atomic force fields. And again, I'm happy to field questions if I um, uh, didn't spend enough time on our particular uh, topic. So what, what I uh, discussed currently was um, backbone dihedral angles. And I basically said that that's a degree of freedom that would be ve very valuable to predict. You can see here, or, and you can see in the experimental data for the Ramachandran plots, the values of phi and psi span a wide range. There's a, a wide range of, ang of angle values that they can take on. And so you can't just set it you know, in your, your, your computational model. You have to somehow, um, you have to be able to predict what it, what it will be. But I did say that there, there, are, there is a simple, the Ramachandran idea of preventing atomic overlap is a good idea. It at least lets you bound it. And we're gonna try to take that further with uh, side chain dihedral angles. So we're gonna focus on um, side, chain side chains or amino acids that have side chains that tend to appear in the dense uh, central regions of the protein, which are cores. And so that's gonna be isoleucine, phenylalanine, valine, tyrosine, tryptophan, leucine, threonine, and serine. And so these have abundances in the central regions of proteins. And they have different um, uh, side chains. And uh, uh, I think almost all of them have two. Um, so three, threonine and serine have one dihedral angle. The others have two dihedral angles. And um, those dihedral angles are going to be called chi's. So the lower value of chi is closer to the backbone. And then as you go up, you know, chi 1, chi 2, chi 3, you move further from the, uh, the C alpha uh, atom. And so a, a hallmark of side chain dihedral angle distribution, so this is for threonine, where you just have one side chain dihedral angle, is they're called rhodomeric. Um, so rhodomer means you can, uh, you're gonna rotate through the side, the side chain dihedral angle possibilities, but there are typically three possible values. And that's what, so this is the distribution of probability distribution of threonine side chain dihedral angles in uh, high resolution protein uh, crystal structures. And you typically get um, three values. So I'm just focusing on like the central regions of these, this like um, three peak distribution. So there's one at uh, 60 degrees, a peak at 60 degrees, there's a peak at 180 degrees, and there's a peak at 300 degrees. And uh, you know th there's a peak, and then there's some uh, distribution around that peak. Um, but you don't typically find uh, dihedral angles at 120 degrees or 240 degrees. And so that's what I mean by rhodomeric. It's not a flat distribution. It's high, a highly peak distribution. The And, and then the, uh, the one of the interesting questions I mean, the, the full question is, can I have some theoretical or computational model that would predict this distribution exactly? Uh, 
but a, a simpler question is, well, can I predict the relative heights of these peaks? So the 60 degree and 300 degree values are roughly equiprobable, whereas the 180 degree peak is, is less probable. And so you're more likely gonna see 60 and 300. Is there some way to understand that? And then you can, you can say the same thing. You can ask the same types of questions for other um, side chains of these amino acids. So isoleucine has, it's a little bit longer or bigger. So it has two side chain dihedral angles, chi one and, and, and chi two. So in general, there should be nine rotomers or in, in principle, there could be nine rotomers because you have three for each side chain uh, dihedral angle. So you have three times three. And so in principle, there could be uh, peaks in the centers of each of these nine bins, um, because in general, we, we say that side chains are rotomeric. But what you find in the experimental structures is that they're not equiprobable. So you don't get uh, one over nine in each of these bins. You get you know, a whopping 60% in um, the rotomer bin number six, which corresponds to a chi one of 300 degrees and a chi two of 180 degrees. And you know, then you get some a pretty good probability in three and four as well. And so again, um, an interesting question and one that's basically sort of step one in protein structure prediction is, can I predict this highly non-uniform probability distribution? And the specific question that I ask uh, in my group and um, that I'm gonna talk about in the next set of slides is uh, are the following three questions. Can the structural properties of protein cores be quantitatively modeled using the approach that was adopted by Ramachandran? That I'm gonna ascribe uh, sizes to um, each of the atoms along the backbone and along the side chain. I'm gonna obey the bond lengths and obey the, um, the bond angles. And then can I predict uh, features of uh, these side chain dihedral angle distributions? If I do ascribe sizes to these, these uh, atoms and I am able to predict the side chain dihedral angle distributions, then those sizes mean something. They have utility, they're useful. And so then I can ask, well, what's the packing fraction? Because if atoms have sizes, you can treat them as you know, physical objects with size. And then I can ask about the packing fraction. And then um, my group has been um, using the packing fraction basically as a feature uh, for uh, protein structure prediction. So let's take a, a one to two minute break while I just call up the next slide presentation. A 30 second break. So can everybody see this? Maybe I get one thumbs up. Got it, thanks. Um, okay, so just at the... Um, since this work has appeared in, in research papers, I just want to thank um, my collaborators. So Lynn Regan, who used to be at, at Yale in molecular biophysics and biochemistry, um, I talk to still to this day um, once a week. And so she's played a big role in this. And then these are three, sorry, four former graduate students that all that did a lot of this work. And they span physics, engineering, and computational biology. So I just include these papers um, in the notes so that if you wanna read more on these topics, uh, you can. So these are some of the papers that have come out on this, on these topics about 
uh, core packing, core repacking, uh, things like that. So I, again, repeat these questions. Um, can structural properties of protein cores, and I'm specifically talking about the side chain dihedral angle distributions of core residues. So if you have a core residue, do you know exactly where the side chain is? Can it be um, quantitatively modeled using just a very simple um, force field? And that force field is just going to be whether the atoms overlap or not. If it can, if you can just say, well, I can predict protein structure by knowing whether atoms overlap or not, then they do have a physical size. And you can ask, well, what is the packing fraction of a core? And how does it compare to other materials um, that we see in, say, physical systems? And then um, hopefully I'll get to a little bit about, um, um, you know, computational design and um, computational approaches for protein structure prediction. But let me just say one thing at the outset is that um, these slides are going to focus on protein cores, and so I just want to remind you why I think that's interesting. So one is that protein cores um, are known to determine the stability of a protein. So if a protein a core is more densely packed or it's more cohesive, then the melting temperature of that protein is known to be higher. So you know, if you study protein cores, then, then you're intrinsically studying the stability of a protein. Another thing which I've alluded to is, is I've said that there is a suggestion from our work that the core can act as a template of the three-dimensional fold of a globular protein. So that it, if you do understand the core, so for example, if you can predict the size of the core, which residues are in the core, then you may be able to do a really good job of folding a protein because it's, it's templated in the sense that the core structure determines some of the less core and surface structure of a, of a fold. And then another area is that when uh, two proteins um, bind, um, you know, for example, the surface of protein A and the surface of protein B bind together to form a complex, the, the two surfaces are then buried and so it's well known that that buried interface acts for all intents and purposes as a core. And so the question is, can we apply all the results that we found for individual protein cores to the binding of, of, of proteins themselves? And so those are three motivations for uh, uh, focusing. This. And, th and then one more will be mutations and I hope I can I get to that. Okay, so onward and upward. So I think in, this took off in, in the 90s um, is um, this idea of validating uh, computational protein structure prediction software from a, this particular question or problem, and it's called the protein repacking problem. And I'll first explain it just with a cartoon and then I'll explain it in detail. So the cartoon is you take a um, jigsaw puzzle, say, let's just consider a, a 2D jigsaw puzzle. So when you construct on a, on a table or flat surface and you, you put it all together and then you take out the, uh, let's say there'll be uh, five or 10 pieces in the central region of that jigsaw puzzle and take them out. So just remove them and put them aside and uh, mix them up. And so the question is, you have this missing uh, central region of the jigsaw puzzle. Is there only one way to put the jigsaw pieces back together and, and solve the jigsaw puzzle with the remaining pieces? And the idea of a jigsaw puzzle, which makes it solvable, uniquely solvable, is that there's only one way to put a jigsaw uh, a puzzle together. And so, uh, the, the jigsaw repacking problem of putting the central uh, jigsaw puzzle pieces in the central region is, is, is a unique um, exercise and can be done. And the question is, 
and, and the reason why that is, is because the jigsaw puzzle is so densely packed and the puzzle pieces are so um, unique or so determined. They're, they're not spheres or, you know, they, they have these unique um, shapes and the ways in which the puzzle pieces fit together is very unique. Whereas if the jigsaw puzzle was not as dense, it was more dilute, the puzzle pieces didn't exactly fit together, then there'd be many ways in which the jigsaw puzzle could be put together. And so people uh, started asking that question in, in the 90s of uh, that, pro that a protein uh, repacking puzzle, where you take a, an experimentally determined uh, X-ray crystal, uh, uh, crystal structure, a protein, and you um, look at the amino acids that form the core and you uh, take them out. And so you can imagine various levels of difficulty of this, uh, this exercise. You could take the entire amino acid out. Uh, you could also take the entire amino acid out and like rotate the relative dihedral angles to, um, you know, to sort of mix it up so the puzzle, so the puzzle, the amino acids don't have their original shapes. Um, and you could also sort of mix up the identities that the you, you didn't know. Uh, you, could, you could sort of try all identities of the of the puzzle pieces. Are the, is it a threonine, a serine, and, and so on and so forth? So I'm going to ask a sub problem where I'm going to keep all the identities the same. So I'm going to say I'm going to take out six residues from the core. But I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna remember which which ones I took out. You know, I'm taking out a methionine, an isoleucine, a cysteine. I remember taking those out. I'm gonna keep those identities fixed. The other thing I'm gonna do for the time being is I'm going to um, keep the, the backbones there. So I'm not I'm not gonna take out the amino acids themselves. I'm just gonna take out the side chains. And so so that's a much easier problem. Now I know what the amino acids are and I know which side chains correspond to those amino acids. I just don't know in what conformation I'm supposed to put the side chains back on. Do I put them on in an extended way? Uh, do, are they bent in certain ways? What conformations of the side chains do I put back on? And so that's called the protein uh, repack. It's called the protein side chain repacking problem. And it's a way to, um, validate your force field if if you're able to put them back in the exact way that the the crystal structure has then it's thought that, that you then have a pretty good force field but in the in the beginning it wasn't clear whether you could do it because if there's a lot of uh, free space and well okay so the way that I'm going to do it is I'm not going to rely on a a um, you know a very complicated force field I'm going to just put them back with uh, using atomic overlaps. Whereas other people will try to put them back on using a complicated force field, which doesn't, doesn't just include atomic overlaps, it includes, um, it can include electrostatics, it can, can include hydrogen bonding, and so on and so forth. So any questions about um, protein side chain repacking? Or um, any other? topics I talked about so far. Okay, I'll keep I'll keep going. So um, I love uh, sometimes I love uh, quoting old literature as long as and, and then making fun of it as long as it's not mine. So here I'm gonna make fun of, um, so uh, there's this nice, uh, it's not exactly a review paper, but it, it reviews, um, you know, thinking about proteins cores as sort of packed, you know, densely packed um, objects. There's a lot of work in the eighties and so then this paper in the 80s and 90s. And so then this paper came out in early 2001 and sort of said what the current state was. It's done by Ken Dill and uh, Liang. Um, the, both of them I, I've talked to and I, I know they're. And so Ken Dill is a, um, has done a lot of work in 
using computational models to, to form proteins. But I, I get to make fun of his early work here. So he, um, there's this paragraph in this paper and he says, what is a good model for the packing inside a protein? Which is, you know, one of the questions we're, we're asking here. Is a protein packed more like a liquid or a solid? So in that question, he's asking if it's packed like a liquid, then each of the liquid atoms or molecules can uh, freely move around. Uh, whereas if it's a solid, then they're, they're locked in place. Uh, based on observations of high packing densi densities and low compressibilities, so sort of solid-like features, protein cores are often considered to be more like solids than liquids. Packings and proteins was first analyzed quantitatively by Richards. So Richards is a, a real pioneer in this area and he worked um, at Yale in the molecular biophysics and biochemistry department. And um, you know, Richards used a Voronoi analysis, well, which I'll talk about in detail in a couple of slides for proteins in a space filling model where each atom is taken to be a sphere with a fixed radius given by the van der Waals radius. So these and other classic papers show that the average packing density inside a protein is as high as that inside crystalline solids. And this yellow uh, shaded region is, is the, the region that I wanna make fun of because that's impossible. So um, when I think of crystalline solids, I think of like metals. Metals are classic, classical crystalline solids. They, um, you know, the atoms in a metal are arranged in very ordered arrangements and they're, they're very dense and their, their packing fractions are very high. Typically, um, you, know, seven, you know, in the mid 70% to 80%. So most of space is, uh, you know, containing atoms. And so my question um, that I wanna answer today and I think it has implications for, you know, protein structure and computational protein structure prediction is, you know, why can that not be true? And to answer that question, we have to answer these intermediate questions. So what is exactly a hard sphere model for protein structure? How do you choose the atom sizes? Um, do you need explicit hydrogens? So early on in, in this field, there's a, there was a extended atom model, which subsumed the hydrogens into the heavy atoms. And so in, in this work, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna have explicit hydrogens. And so that can make a difference. Then I'm gonna show you why that yellow statement um, doesn't make a lot of sense and that the packing correction has to be below that for you know, crystalline materials. So I do want to mention that I do say X-ray crystal structures a lot. Um, and so that could be confusing, but when you have an X-ray crystal structure, the proteins, the full, the entire protein sits on some type of crystal lattice, but the individual atoms within a protein do not sit on a crystal lattice. And that's the distinction I'm making. So again, like the center of mass of each protein um, in a crystal structure can sit on a crystal lattice. But the question that we're asking today is whether the individual atoms in each protein are sitting on a crystal lattice. And those don't have to go hand in hand. So just to remind you, these are the amino acids that I'm talking about. These tend to be the hydrophobic amino acids as well as um, serine and threonine, which tend to appear in the cores of proteins. I don't think I've shown this before, uh, but I wanted to, um, I, I just wanted to let you know that we do have lots of structures that are high resolution. And so we have a few thousand in, in typical cases of each type of residue. And so it provides a large data set of the uh, side chain dihedral angles. I've already shown this. Um, the degrees of freedom that we're going to be interested in are the dihedral angles, not the uh, backbone stereochemistry. So again, um, what we're interested in is um, 
understanding whether what's the connection between atom size and the ability to predict um, side chain dihedral angle distributions. So I don't think I've shown this one before. This is the valine uh, side chain dihedral angle distribution um, from X-ray crystal structures. So valine just has one side chain dihedral angle, chi one, and in contrast to a, a threonine, the uh, central rotomer, the 180 degree rotomer, is um, very highly um, probable, whereas the outer ones, the 60 and 300, are um, you know a factor of three at least uh, less likely to occur. And again, uh, leucine and isoleucine have uh, three have, have two side chain dihedral angles, and so. Uh, three rotomers per side chain dihedral angle. So in principle, there can be nine rotomers, but uh, leucine tends to have one very highly populated uh, rotomer um, and two sort of weakly populated rotomers. And then leucine has uh, two more equally probable uh, uh, rotomers of the, of the nine. And so the idea is, is there a, a hard sphere plus stereochemical constraint model basically a Ramachandran type model that can predict these um, side, chain side chain dihedral angle distributions. So again, uh, taking snippets from the literature and then uh, making fun of it in a, in a very nice way. Uh, here is a, a snippet from a, a uh, side chain repacking paper. Um, Uh, I think from the mid uh, 2010s. So it says in recent work, Peterson and co-workers performed side chain recovery for 200 proteins using six different protein software suites. And so protein side chain recovery is basically this side chain repacking that I was talking about. And so they, they use uh, Squirrel and the, each of these side chain, these, each of these software suites has interesting names. There's Squirrel, S-C-W-R-L, there's Oscar, there's Rasp, SC Comp, uh, Rosetta. And um, they're gonna use these different uh, software suites and, and, see, and compare their performance. The key component of computational protein design software is the energy function. Um, and it includes many terms. So this is the approach of some of the, of, of a lot of the community is they'll include a lot of terms in their energy function. So it's stereochemistry, which I agree is very important. So it's potentials that enforce bond lengths and bond angles. And then they include lots of additional terms. Um, statistical potentials that sort of bias the side chain rotomers, repulsive and attractive van der Waals interactions, hydrogen bonding, electrostatics, disulfide bonds, and the last one I don't like, ad hoc pairwise residue potential. I don't like anything that begins with ad hoc because that sort of means synonymous with wrong. Um, and then the biggest thing is that we're not sure what the weights for those, you know, you have eight terms. There's lots of different weighting functions you could add, you know, the second term's really strong, the eighth term's weak, the eighth term's really weak, really strong, the second term's really weak, all, all sorts of different types of weightings. And so, with this type of approach, um, it's really hard to understand which of the terms is dominant or if, you know, is it possible that there could only be a couple dominant terms which would actually be able to do side chain um, uh, recovery really well. Uh, so we take a, a, a different approach. There's basically uh, two of those terms of the eight that they talked about. So the one is the stereochemistry. We respect all the stereochemistry I discussed. That is, um, you know, bond lengths are enforced, bond angles, all bond angles are enforced. And then the, the only thing that we add is a non-bonded interaction, which looks like the uh, top equation. So the top equation, if you don't like equations and you want to see a picture, I'll show a picture in the next um, slide. 
um, basically says if two atoms overlap, if two non-bonded if two non-bonded atoms overlap, there's a large energy penalty, so the energy increases rapidly. But if two uh, non-bonded atoms don't overlap, then there's no energy cost. So this energy function really weights um, uh, confirmations that don't um, have atomic overlap. It weights those very highly relative to confirmations where there's non-bonded atom overlaps. And what you can do is use a Boltzmann weighting um, you know, to favor uh, confirmations with little atomic overlap. So here's the movie. Um, so then what we do is you can ask, and I'll emphasize this more in the next slide, is you can, you can do the Ramachandran thing where you take the amino acid out of the context of the protein and you can you know, include it in the context of the protein. So if you take the amino acid, like I'm showing here, this is at least leucine amino acid taken from a protein crystal structure, but then it's, it's just in vacuum. There's nothing around it. And so what you, you can then do is try all possible combinations of the side chain dihedral angles. And then you can ask, are there intra residue overlaps? So I-N-T-R-A. So intra meaning, are there overlaps between non-bonded atoms that exist within this um, dipe leucine dipeptide? And so that would be like the analogous Ramachandran question about if I isolate this dipeptide, do I have overlaps at certain specific values of, of, of chi one and chi two? And then you could also ask, I'm going to place this leucine in the context of its experimental uh, crystal structure. Then I do rotations and I ask, are there overlaps coming from atoms within the residue as well as atoms in, in the residue that I'm on, like this leucine, with other residues in the surrounding environment. And those would be inter-residue or inter-amino acid, that's I-N-T-E-R, um, atomic overlaps. So for this particular movie, I'm just gonna look at intra-residue overlaps. And so the vertical axis represents the overlap energy between atoms, non-bonded atoms. And so you're gonna see fluctuations that occur, the energy is gonna go up and down depending on what um, chi two value I select. And so in this particular map, I'm, I'm fixing chi one and I'm varying chi two, but you can imagine that in general, I wanna do this in a two dimensional plane and then map out the surface, the, the energy as a function of chi one and chi two. And it's not playing. So hold on one second. Okay, so um, I'm going to have to play that movie tomorrow because I have to locate it. So it's this issue of that the PowerPoint is having trouble locating the, the original movie. And so I'll just describe it to you and then I'll show it to you on, on the, during the next lecture. So basically what's gonna happen is that as you sweep um, Kai 2 from zero and zero to 360 degrees, this, it's gonna fluctuate up and down. And what it turns out is that the 180 degree confirmation of chi two is the lowest energy structure. And so that's where we're gonna predict that this particular uh, side chain dihedral angle should be placed. So um, what I want you to imagine is that I don't know the sizes of the atoms a priori, that there's no 
there's no sort of Wikipedia page or lookup table where I can just say, oh, well, this is the size, you know, of each atom because the size of an atom is an intrinsically quantum mechanical phenomenon. And, and, and so in that sense, the, uh, you know, the size of an atom could depend on its, its conditions. So it's, if it's a, in a liquid environment, you know, the size of an atom could appear to be a certain size, whereas if it was in a more condensed environment, it would have a different size. So I'm gonna treat the atom size currently as a variable and then I, you know, within reasonable bounds, and then I'm going to say that I'm going to choose the atom size that does the best side chain recovery. And so then atom size has meaning to me in this context. It is the atom size that yields the proper experimentally um, determined side chain dihedral angle uh, distributions. So for example, what I've done here is I've looked in the literature, the colorful symbols uh, represent literature values, um, both experimental and computational uh, values of the atomic radius that have been quoted uh, for the different um, atoms. And I've also um, allowed uh, two different values for um, the carbon. So I have a different size for the carboxyl carbon for other compared to other types of carbon. And so what we did is we did these uh, side chain recovery analyses as a function of size over the full range of these um, colorful symbols, so the, the literature. So you can imagine randomly sampling combinations of atomic sizes and then uh, seeing how well side chain recovery goes. So for example, I'm just gonna pick one randomly. The hydrogen is one angstrom, the nitrogen is 1.5 angstroms, non-carboxyl carbons are 1.8 angstroms, carboxyl carbons are um, 1.5 angstroms, the oxygens are 1.4 angstroms, and sulfur is 1.8 angstroms. So that's a random choice of atom sizes within this um, distribution. And so we tried all of them and all is in quotes, we randomly sampled and tried a lot. And what you find is that the, the black symbols give the uh, best uh, agreement to side chain recovery just as, uh, as with the dipeptide model. Okay, so, so now we have atomic sizes and we're gonna try to do, um, we're gonna try to see if we look at the, um, the amino acids in the context of the, uh, of the protein, does it specify the side chain exactly? I'm gonna skip this because I'm gonna talk about it later. This is talking about how we decide which residues are core residues. And so this is uh, what I was talking about before that if you look at um, a residue in the absence of its, um, so if you look at a core residue, um, a wet, not in the core, you just look at it isolated. So you have the condition on the left that the, um, the overlaps between atoms can only arise from um, within your residue. Whereas if you're looking at the, the leucine in the context of an experimental crystal structure, they can, it can have atomic overlaps with neighboring residues. So then I, I show you the um, results from the dipeptide is that, um, so in, special, in the example of isoleucine, um, you see the experimental data is on the left. And again, you see that their rotomer number six is very, very uh, highly probable, 60% uh, uh, probability in that particular rotomer. And then you have the prediction from the uh, the dipeptide isoleucine. And you see that I get the rhodomeric features right. Um, so the atom sizes are calibrated in that sense. Um, and do you see that you're, you're starting to see a preference for rhodomer six, but the, um, 
the probabilities are a little too uniform, that the probabilities in three, four, five, and six are relatively close, um, whereas there's a big uh, difference between um, rotamers three and four and number six. And what we believe um, will happen is that we'll be able to predict the experimental um, uh, probabilities more exactly if we look in the context of the protein. Okay, and so that's what we do. So um, here I switch to a, um, a an isoleucine. Sorry, let me look at yeah. So I'm still looking at an isoleucine. Um, the um, for this particular isoleucine, again, the dipeptide uh, gives a more uniform um, uh, uh, probability. It doesn't exactly agree with the dipeptide from the previous example because the, the bond angles and bond lengths are a little bit different for this particular dipeptide, this particular isoleucine. But you again, you again get the rhodomeric feature. Uh, but then when you put this particular isoleucine, isoleucine 56 from this uh, protein 2NWD, uh, that's the protein data bank identifier, then what you do is you look at this isoleucine in that uh, protein environment, and then you try all the Chi1, Chi2s, and then you see that there's only a probability density at um, uh, location number five, uh, which is where the crystal structure is. So um, the X corresponds to the uh, side chain dihedral angle that's in the uh, crystal structure itself. And then we find if we sample all of the possible Chi1 and Chi2s, the only one that doesn't allow intra and inter residue overlaps, uh, large um, overlaps is the one that's very close to the one that was observed in the protein crystal structure. And so that's really good news. And it suggests that since it worked for that particular isoleucine, isoleucine 56 and 2NWD, well, why wouldn't it work for other residues? And if it does work for other residues, then you can exactly um, recapitulate the, um, the observed side chain dihedral angle distribution because um, th that's how the experimental distribution is constructed. So this works for other residues as well. Um, if you look at uh, phenylalanine, the dipeptide prediction um, looks a little bit different because, well, first of all, it, uh, well, it's a Chi1, Chi2 map. It's a little broader, but then when you um, localize it to the environment so that you allow both intra and inter-residue overlaps, um, you get that the crisp, the specific side chain dihedral angle combination that's in that particular crystal structure is the only one that's allowed. And the same, free, same thing for valine. When you look at uh, a particular valine, the, uh, you get a rot rotomeric structure if it's just in the dipeptide model. But then when you put it in the context of the protein, then only the particular one that's um, sampled in the particular crystal structure that we look at that's the dashed, uh, the uh, dotted vertical line, is the, the, the prediction agrees with the, the one that occurs in the crystal structure. And so then what you can do is, uh, instead of just doing one uh, isoleucine, you can do all the isoleucines in a particular data set. And so I just showed you an example of one, but we did all of them. And then you can basically combine the distribution. So you put one particular isoleucine in the protein environment, you sample all uh, Chi1 and Chi2s, um, you get your prediction, then you do the next one, uh, you get your prediction for the probability distribution, and then you average those probability distributions over all possible residues. And that's what uh, panel B is. And so, uh, when you include the environment of the protein, you get a quantitatively accurate prediction of the side chain dihedral angle distribution. In particular, rotomer six 
for isoleucine is very highly populated, around 70%. Um, and four and three are much lower than that, but they're still you know, non-negligible values, you know, 12% and 7%, but it's very quantitative. Um, so with that, um, I will end for today since it's uh, 2.15. Um, uh, next week, I will finish uh, this presentation. I will show you the movies of the um, hard sphere plus chemical constraint model so you can see how I'm doing these side chain dihedral angle rotations. And then um, looks like I'm running one lecture behind. And so the following lecture on Monday, I will uh, start with intrinsically disordered proteins. So again, um, we're having an extra lecture uh, this week. So it's Thursday, tomorrow, Thursday at one, I'll finish up globular proteins. And then on Monday, I'll start intrin intrinsically disordered proteins. I'll pause for a little while um, for questions. And then we will sign off.